Buckle up and hold on. At our church, we love God. Make no mistake about that. At our church, we believe in God's radical, unconditional, and unwavering love for us. At our church, we believe that Jesus is God. We also affirm that you may or may not believe that Jesus is God. And we're not asking you to change your belief system before you attend our church. We're simply inviting you on a journey toward Jesus. For years, churches have placed a high priority on Jesus as the get out of hell free card. At our church, we place the highest priority on Jesus as a live life to the fullest invitation. At our church, we believe every person has a dream deep inside their hearts and that God put that dream there, not for our glory, but for His. At our church, we're not concerned with where you've been, but where you're going. At our church, we believe that the Bible is God's Word. It is real. It is living. It is active. We believe that people who don't go to church anywhere are not the enemy. They are real people who need the perfect love that only God can give. And we believe that God gives this love through, of all people, us. At our church, we do not and we will not display a holier-than-thou attitude toward anyone. We are all broken people, but He is putting us back together. And finally, and most importantly, at our church, we believe that Jesus really lived, that He really died on the cross, and that He really rose again on the third day. And we cannot and we will not candy coat or water down that message, ever. Today, you've chosen to sit yourself in the middle of a very safe place to hear a potentially dangerous message. Welcome to our church. What happens when you lose your sermon slides before, before church? So not a whole lot of announcements for you guys this morning, uh, other than our regular ones. Hey, Ian, can you turn me down just a little bit? I'm ringing. Thanks. So uh, we'll go through. There's no, no ladies Bible study today. No women to victory today. Uh, men, we've got brotherhood coming up on Monday. I will email everybody out stuff. Uh, we've got Bible study on Tuesday night. Uh, we're still working our, working our way through Job. Still. Poor Job. Uh, then we've got Fridays. We are heading down to the First Baptist of Bath Soup Kitchen. We have a great time. If you guys are able to go and do this, we have so much fun doing this. Uh, I got to tell you guys a quick story about that. Uh, this past week, uh, there's a lady that, that comes and works in the soup kitchen. She's not a member of that church, but she's a member of a church. And she comes and she works at the soup kitchen. She had no idea that we were a real church. <laughs> she kind of was telling us, oh, you know, it must be nice to have your church out in, out in the wind. And, you know, she, she was kind of you know, giving us a couple of little jabs. And then she found out that we actually have a physical building, although we are a church that goes out. And she was very skeptical and verbally skeptical. We'll put it that way. <laughs> very verbally skeptical. And then we started talking about what we believe and what we do. And she got very serious and she kind of had this look come over her face. And then she had the recollection of, well, my church doesn't do any of these things. And she came up to me a few minutes later and she says, you know, I got I to apologize. I said, for what? She goes, I judged you. And I said, I know. <laughs> and that's okay, because let's face it, this gets judged a lot by its appearance. And so she said, I'm really sorry that, that I judged you. And I don't under tell me if this sounds familiar. I don't understand the way that you look because you don't look like a Christian. But boy, don't you sound like one. <laughs> And I said, yeah, that, that's, kind, that's kind of the thing. I said, Jesus didn't look like a Christian either. But I'm really glad that we're having this conversation and she's going to come and visit us because she wants to see you guys. She, she's kind of seen the hot mess of the guys that come down. <laughs> she wants to see that everybody else is the way that we are. And, you know, it, it was wonderful that we had that experience. So if you guys have an opportunity and you have a Friday morning off and you want to come and serve some food with us, and it, 
it's a good time. So we meet up at 8 o'clock-ish at Kevin Kimball's house out in the middle of nowhere. It's a great time. I'm going to drive this week. <laughs> I offered to drive this week because I got a new truck. <laughs> so then Saturday morning, this past Saturday, we, uh, we as the guys went out to breakfast. A bunch of us went out to, to Denny's and had some food and it was awesome. And here comes Eck Mick. So we had a good time. We'd like to do this on a fairly frequent basis. Um, we're going to go again this Saturday for anybody that wants to go. Uh, location will be to be determined, but evidently we're going to keep the same time because Andy likes early mornings and discount wood. <laughs> so it was still there. Awesome. So yeah, what we'll do is we'll, we'll figure out where we want to go this week and we'll, I'll let everybody know. Uh, I'll pick you up. We'll go for breakfast. Well, that's no good. You tell them you're coming late. <laughs> All right. You're forgiven then. So we'll figure out how we can do that. Uh, but I, I did, we had a great time, and I thought it was awesome. Uh, but other than that, I've got anybody else have anything that's going on that we want to talk about before we get into worship today? Uh, yeah, Kev, what do you got? Pray for my wife. For guidance. Okay. No, she gets to live with Kevin. <laughs> well, let's, 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 pray, let's pray for you. What was your wife's name again? I'm so sorry. Louise, that's right. Well, let's pray for Louise right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Louise, and we thank you for your presence today, and we thank you for your presence in her life. Lord, Louise needs some guidance, and you know what it's for. We don't, but you do. So, Lord, we ask that you go before her, you go before her, you order her steps, you give her the wisdom that she needs to be able to do what she has to do and make the decisions that she needs to make. But Lord, we ask that you, first and foremost, that you do great things through her and in her life. Uh, let the world see you through her. Uh, so Lord, we just ask that you, you have your will in Louise's life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, oh, anytime. Henry, what do you got? Jake and Alan Hewitt. Alan Hewitt. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's pray for that now. Heavenly Father, we come again for, for Jake and Alan Hewitt. Uh, there is an illness in this family, Lord, that, that's, let's face it, it's going to take somebody that they love. So, Lord, we ask that you, you make that transition smooth. If, if you can heal, we ask that you do. But if you can't, we ask that that transition be, be smooth and quick. And first and foremost, please make your presence known in this person's life. Because going into eternity without knowing you and out, without having that relationship with you, that, that's the worst possible thing that we could ever do. So Lord, we ask that you, you make an offer of salvation and let him see you. Let him see your face. Let him see your hand. But Lord, we ask that you, you give their family strength, that we ask that you give them comfort, and we ask that you, you give them the guidance and, the, and, the, and what they need moving forward so they can handle this with grace and dignity in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody else have anything we want to pray for before we get started? Let's pray for Ian again. We already prayed for Ian once, and oh my word, it was awesome. We... we Ian's been having, for those of you that don't know, for people watching online, Ian's been having some visual issues. And his doctor wasn't... Ian, why don't you come up here? Quick second. We want to pray for you real quick. So Ian's, Ian's having some visual issues, and his doctor wasn't exactly great about sending in the referral, we'll say. Uh, so the eye doctors didn't get him in for quite a while. I was in a meeting Thursday morning... And I felt really strongly that we needed to pray. Don't fall off the stage. <laughs> I felt like we needed, to, we needed to pray for Ian uh, during this meeting. So we did. And it was funny because we prayed for Ian exactly at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And by 2.15, I got a text message from Ian saying that Jesus was great because his doctor got him in the next day. Just saying. Tell me power of prayer doesn't work and God isn't great. So I'm going to have everybody come up. You don't have to coach me. I know how to do this. <laughs> I'm going to have everybody come up. We're going to pray for Ian. 
Uh, but we're going we're gonna, to, now that we kind of know what's going on, we're going to pray that God has his way in a healing. And let's not fall through the floor. There's not enough no of us jumping. to fall through the floor. No jumping jacks. <laughs> All right, so come on in. Let's pray for Ian. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we love Ian and we love you and we thank you for the work that he, you're doing in his life. Uh, Lord, we ask that you completely heal his vision. Uh, all of the things that are causing this, Lord, we ask that you take them away. We, we ask that you give Ian the faith to walk in what you're telling him is wrong and what you're telling him you're going to do that is going to fix it. So, Lord, we, we ask for a healing. We ask for complete faith for Ian in you that this is possible. But, Lord, give, the, give doctors the ability to show him what it is and put him on a course of correction. But, Lord, we ask that you give him a wonderful healing in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you in advance, Jesus. And evidently I'm getting one in on my phone. Hang on a second. Where did that go? Now the moment of truth. Yes. Do not fall over. Yes. All right. Okay. No uppies. All right. Anybody else have anything we need to pray for? My kids need to pray for a, a de herring of ECMIC after this. <laughs> Anybody else have any prayer? Any other prayer requests before we before we jump into worship? Awesome. Why don't we stand and worship God? Am I on? There I am. All right. Have a seat. Let's release the children out to Chopper Church today. We've got children here. Poor Ekmek is going to have to be all by himself now. <laughs> no. All right, so we... We're in week number two of a series on prayer that's going to take us right to Easter this year. Because Easter's just in a couple of weeks, guys. That's exciting. I love Easter. So we're in week number two. Uh, this is a series we have called Ask. It's all about prayer. And the title of this series has actually come from a book by Paul Miller called A Praying Life. And the premise of the whole book is that you could take all of the teachings of Jesus that he taught about prayer, and you could sum it all up into two simple words that are just, it's just ask. That's what, he, that's what he's, he's, he's looking for us to do, is just ask. So last week, we saw that Jesus, he instructed us how to pray for basically four different ways. He asked us to pray desperately and boldly, and persistently and trustingly. And do you guys remember the story I told you about my friend whose kids don't quite understand the concept of no? You guys remember that? No is just an invitation to debate for those little rug monkeys to systematically wear their parents down by asking the same question for the same thing over and over and over and over again. No isn't no. No is just an open invitation to start the negotiations. So that kind of got me thinking. And it made me realize that we all kind of have issues when we pray. It's one of the things that we as Christians, we, we shy a Against, you know, praying out loud, praying in front of other people, praying with other people, it's something we shy against. You know, maybe we ramble a little bit, or maybe we say things that don't make sense. You know, maybe, maybe we repeat a phrase a lot, or, for example, one of the guys that teaches our recovery class, he, he uses... God's name a lot when he prays. It's Lord Jesus God. He pray, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but maybe he does that a lot. Or, or maybe we say um or uh or just a lot. And some people, some people are prayer lecturers. I'm glad we don't have any of them here. But some people pray lecture and where you're, you're kind of praying, but you're kind of instructing and you're kind of gossiping all at the same time. Because preach praying can be very dangerous to your health if you don't know your crowd. You know, Lord, please let Sally and her new boyfriend 
let, let, let them th- help them deal with their purity because, you know, Lord, you've called us to, to purity in our inner beings and, and Lord, sometimes I see the lust that they have in their eyes for each other. That's a really good way to get that Holy Ghost punch in the face from Sally. Just letting you guys know, don't do it. One of, I, there's a Christian comedian named John Christie. He's one of my favorite people to listen to. When I'm feeling down, I love listening to him. He lifts me back up. And I came across one of his stand-up pieces, and he was talking about prayer. And I said, oh, this is going to fit really good in my sermon this week, so I want to share this with you guys. He's, in one of his stand-ups, he says, have you ever had somebody ask you to pray for something that is so dumb that you think, um... I'm not going to pray for that. Would you pray for my son? He's in the finals of a karate tournament tomorrow. Well, what exactly am I supposed to pray? Jesus, when Connor steps on that mat tomorrow, would you guide his foot into that other little boy's face in the name of Jesus? Be the great physician that you are, Lord, and just render his opponent unconscious in the Lord's name. How do you pray for that? (laughs) And honestly, some things with prayer I still don't understand after doing this all these years. I'm still not sure exactly what we do about praying for food. You know, Lord bless this food in the hands that prepared it. Why do we only ask about the hands? What about the rest of the body? See, this is why I'm here. Nobody asks the hard questions. I'm willing to ask hard questions for you people. What about the rest of the body? Anyways... I'm grateful. I'm grateful that Jesus gave us Scripture in the New Testament and He explains to the disciples the how to pray thing. Because one of the things that we hear the most, people that are in ministry, is, I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to pray. Jesus gives us an outline. He gives us a template. There's the guide that He gives us that should shape all the prayers that you pray. Now, last week, we talked about overcoming the obstacle of all obstacles in our prayer life. Anybody remember what that was? Unanswered prayers. Everybody's looking at me like I don't know what I'm talking about. I have my notes. I was there. Unanswered prayers. And and, and it encouraged me that here's Jesus. He teaches his disciples. They come to him and they say, Lord, teach us how to pray. So he does, and then the next thing that he does is he teaches them what to do about unanswered prayers. Because Jesus knew that that was going to be our biggest emotional and spiritual obstacle when we don't get what we want. Because he knew what our nature was going to be. So this week, this week we're going to hit the, probably the second biggest elephant we have in the room. Which is the statement, I don't know how to pray. So just like last week, our answer is going to be in Luke chapter 11. So I'll have you guys turn to your Bibles to Luke chapter 11. Uh, We're going to start in verses 1 and 2. And this is a reminder from last week. So verses 1 and 2 in Luke chapter 11 says, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray say, and then there's the rest of the scripture there. And I want you guys to say, I want to stop there because I want you to see something that's important. It, it, what's important here is that we've not just been taught to pray. He's teaching us how to do it. So there's two things that he's, he talks about here. It's not just important of teach me what to say. He's teaching us it's important to say it. And that's the thing that we miss so many times in our, in our relationship with God. We miss the opportunity to converse with Him. He wants to talk to us. He wants us to talk to Him. So it's important to see here that we're not just being taught to pray, we're being taught how to pray. But Jesus isn't saying, well, you, you can go to God however you want. Just say what's on your heart and all prayers are acceptable because that's not what he's saying here. That's not what he says. The truth is, is not all prayers are acceptable. 
Jesus teaches us that there's a specific way that he, that he wants us and that we should be approaching God. And we're going to talk about that today. And in fact, in Matthew's recording of this, this exact same teaching, he tells us that Jesus, before he teaches his disciples how to pray, what does he do? He teaches them how not to. So not all prayers are acceptable. And we're going to talk about first, we're going to talk about how not to pray. And every religion teaches its, it teaches its followers how to pray. But Christian prayer is altogether different because we get instructions on how not to do it. Yay! What a great idea! Thank you, Jesus. So Jesus teaches his disciples how not to pray. Matthew, keep your fingers in your Bible in Luke. Flip over to Matthew chapter 6. I'll give you guys a second to get there. We're going to be in verse 5 through 8. It's before Luke. So it says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on the street corners and in the synagogues where everybody can see them. I tell you the truth. That's all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray... Go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on like the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. For your Father knows exactly what you need before you ask Him. So there's two different examples here that Jesus gives his disciples, right? There's two different, there's two different examples. And what I thought was kind of cool is we, we've talked about Jewish houses, the, the first century Jewish houses, and how they were kind of big open room. You guys remember that when we were talking about the, the guy knocking on the door for bread? Well, did you know that there was one lock on one door in, in a Jewish home? And it wasn't the front door. There was a storage room in every Jewish home Think of it like a pantry. And that door was lockable. So what that first part, by the way, I thought was pretty cool, where it says, shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Lock yourself away so nobody else can get to you. That's what he was talking about. He was tell, talking about lock, don't lock yourself in the pantry when you get home, please. But that's what he was talking about. Sorry, let me get back on point here. But don't you think that it's kind of interesting that one of the only kinds of prayer that Jesus ever criticized are prayers that are too long. And many in the church said, Amen. Right? Now, I want, you to, I want to point out and I want you to notice that it says nothing about long sermons, so sit down and buckle up. <laughs> it says nothing about long sermons. But what did Jesus have against long prayers? Well, it wasn't so much the long prayers that he had a problem with. The prayers, the people that were praying, they thought that they were being heard because of their many words that they used. They thought that because they were praying for a certain amount of time, or with a certain amount of flair, or they whipped themselves into a certain spiritual place or frenzy, that God was going to hear them. And that's not what Jesus is talking about here. And almost, again, almost every religion teaches some form of this. If you say so many Hail Marys, God's going to hear you. If you repeat enough verses out of the Quran, maybe if you repeat enough mantras in your Buddhism, or maybe if you yell, Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, loud enough and long enough, He's going to hear you. It's not what we're talking about here. The word Jesus uses here translates to the word anxious. We talk about anxiety a lot because a lot of us have it. Is God going to hear me when I pray? Did I say the right thing, use the right words? Was I eloquent enough? Did I pray long enough? Did I break through that glass ceiling that I know is there that keeps God from hearing me? Jesus says that we pray to a loving Father, right? 
We have a father that doesn't, that we don't have to convince to care about us. We have a father who knows what we need even before we ask. And we should never approach God as if we have to make ourselves worthy. Because let's face it, we're never going to be. But we shouldn't have to try to make ourselves worthy. We're grafted into God's family. And that grafting doesn't fluctuate with the behavior of the child being grafted in, thank you Jesus, because I never would have been there. We're children of an almighty God and, and there's nothing that we can do to entice God to hear us. But prayer begins when we embrace that God is our Father. That's what Jesus starts with here. That's how Jesus starts his prayer. When he teaches his disciples, this is how you pray. What's the first thing he says? Our Father. How we approach God in prayer is where we really demonstrate whether we really understand the gospel or not. When we slow down and when we pray, we can be immediately confronted about how unspiritual we actually are. Anybody else like this? Because I am. I go through, when I pray, all of a sudden I get this little voice that's in the back of my head. Some of the things that you ask God for, Chris, are just utterly ridiculous. Why are you bothering someone so important with something so stupid? Sound familiar, anybody? Yeah, me too. I'm always wondering, did I use the right words? Because when I was taught to pray, and I was taught to pray, it was very much what Jesus said not to do. But it's still inside me. Am I using the right words? Am I flailing around enough? Am I in the right posture? Am I asking with the right motives in my heart? Because... The Bible says if we ask, and it's in God's will, He'll grant it. Am I asking with the right motives in my heart? You guys ever see a kid that wants something? Kids never, ever get frozen by their selfishness. They come like they are. They're very focused, and oftentimes very self-absorbed. They're kids, that's what they do. But Jesus says to, that we're supposed to become like a little child when we pray. So how do children ask? They confidently come to their parents and boldly say what's on their mind, sometimes a little too boldly. There's no concept of what's appropriate and what's not. There's no political correctness whatsoever in what they're asking about. They just come, blam, dad, I need this. And usually with my kids, it's like, okay. But God accepts us in our mess. He accepts us with all of our mess and because He accepts us because of the finished work of Jesus. We serve a God that doesn't stop thinking about us, church. He rejoices over us. And He knows every single hair on our head when it falls out. Dang it! Got to stop with the hair references. The Bible needs to stop with the hair references. I feel seen. So when we pray, go boldly before the throne of God and say, Father, I have a need. I need this. And I believe that you can provide it. Tell Him what's on your heart. He doesn't require fancy posturing. He doesn't require fancy words. He doesn't want you to obsess about how unspiritual you are. He doesn't care the words that come out of your mouth. He cares about what you say out of your heart, guys. That's what He cares about. I came across a picture of John F. Kennedy. And he's sitting behind his desk in the Oval Office... And he's got a piece of paper in his hand, which I'm sure was something that was going to change the whole course of the free world. And there peeking out from under the desk is John Jr., right? 
He's looking up at his dad. And it kind of made me realize that here's this kid that has a completely and totally different relationship with the man that was the leader of the free world. And he's looking at his dad like, that's not the leader of the free world. That's not the president of the United States. That's my dad and I want Cheerios. Maybe he'll get them for me. So it just kind of made me think that that's how we're supposed to be looking at, at God. So after our father... May your name be holy. Some translations say, hallowed be your name. And before we get into explaining this, I think it's interesting that, go, that before we get into the requests of our prayer, and let's face it, when we pray, our prayers are dominated with requests for God. Would you guys agree with that? Okay. I want to make sure we're on the same page. There are several phrases that focus on our relationship with God even before we get into asking him for the laundry list of stuff that we've got. It goes to show us that prayer is more important, it's more important about prayer to be in the right relation with God than it is about the stuff that we're asking for. Hallowed be your name should precede any request that we make of God. What does hallowed mean? It sounds scary. It's almost like one of those, I expect to see like a headless guy on a horse. What does hallowed mean? There's a hallowed app now. Jesus is on it. And Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> but it sounds scary. I got to tell you, it's funny that this became, a, this became like one of those little reels or something. When I was a kid, I, I grew up with this guy named Mike. Uh, he was, his family was Roman Catholic. Mine was not. We went to a different kind of a church. So, but there were times, he, he was my best friend. And if you ask, a lot of my passwords have to do with something that's around him. And we would go to, he would go, I would go to church with his family. They would, he would come to church with my family. And years later, he confesses to me in a moment of absolute humor that up until he was eight years old, he thought God's name was Harold. And I was like, huh? He said, yeah, our Father, who art in heaven, Harold be your name. <laughs> and it's funny that that actually became like this thing on the internet because lots of people thought that. But hallowed means two things. First, it can mean most beautiful. Hallowed. God is better than anything that you could ever ask him for. If you were to take all of those things, put them in a blender, wind them all up and pour it out as one big thing, God is still better than that. And a lot of people approach God like a spiritual slot machine. He's a means to an end. Let's pull the arm. Let's see what the dials say. Let's see if I'm going to get what I need this time. God, I need a healing. <clears throat> God, get me out of this speeding ticket. Kadoom, I'll pull that one twice. Lord, I really need this job. But seeing God as holy, he mean, that, that, that means more than seeing him as greater than every earthly gift. God, I'd love to have that new job. I'd love to have a healthy body. I would love to not have to pay that speeding ticket. Boom. But you're greater than all of those things, God. And even if I don't get those things, I might be a little disappointed. But it's not going to ruin my joy and it's not going to affect my joy. It's not going to affect my confidence in life because I have you. And that's the greatest gift that I could have ever been given. Hallowed can also mean most worthy. If you guys get nothing else out of today, get this, okay? Here's your aha moment. I'm going to give this one to you. When we recognize that the very point of our existence, the very point of our very lives here on earth is to glorify God. When we realize that this life isn't about me and it's not about God prospering me, 
It's about his name. It's about his kingdom. Man, what a great day that's going to be. A lot of times we rush right into prayer, forgetting that, forgetting why we even, we're even here. Because we get so wrapped up in us and we get wrapped up in ourselves that we forget. It's not about us, it's about him. He's not a servant that we're putting to work for our purposes. He's not the pinata. And prayer isn't the whacking stick to get the stuff that we need for our party to make it better. I'm going to illustrate a point to you guys. Brattle like this. Anybody here a Star Wars nerd? Okay. Anybody here have an idea who Biggs Darklighter is? I didn't think so. I know something you don't know. I'm just kidding. Anyways, n- doesn't surprise me. Most people don't know who this is. Henry, do you know who he is? You got your hand half up. Biggs Darklighter. Nope. I didn't know who it was either. I didn't know who it was either. I actually did a lot of research on the Google machine for this. He was the fighter pilot in the first Star Wars who shielded Luke Skywalker from getting killed so he could blow up the Death Star. Ha ha! Yes. Without Biggs, all 987 Star Wars movies would never have gotten off the ground, and yet nobody has heard of him. And I think if Biggs was here today, if he came back from the grave from a galaxy far, far away, if he was here today, he would stand up here and say, I don't care that nobody knows who I am. Because my small sliver of the story was only to serve the purposes of the main character, my homie Luke Skywalker, so he didn't get blown up. God's glory is the main character in our lives, church. And when we recognize the point of all the things that happen to us, and we we realize that it's not about us, He put us in a place, in a time, in a situation that how we respond and how we get through it will glorify Him. God could possibly make His name holy before others by prospering you. And isn't that awesome when that happens? And He makes His name holy through that situation because you give Him credit for your successes. You see the difference there? Yeah, you give him credit for your successes. And you give him credit by him using you for your success to further the kingdom of God. Hmm. But he also might make his name holy by letting you suffer. That's not not an easy thing to hear. But he might make his name holy by letting you suffer so you can have joy in bad circumstances. Everybody's looking at me like I'm a lunatic right now. Because you know that he is better than health. He's better than riches. He's better than the job that you need. He's better than all of it. The point of our lives is not living and dying. The point of our lives is glorifying God. And sometimes God is glorified when sick people get well. Praise Jesus, they get well. But sometimes, sometimes God is glorified when they suffer well and when they die well. It's all about how they go through it. And that's hard for us to get our hearts around. Let's take a look at the next piece. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now this here. This here is something that we struggle with. This here is all about surrendering ourselves to follow after God's agenda. Prayer isn't supposed to be to get God to help us in all of our stuff. Prayer is about joining God where He is doing the work that He's doing. Not the other way around. 
And truth be told, we should be praying our way through Scripture. The words in these pages here. These pages. This is how we know what God wants to do in this world. He tells us, guys. He gives us knowledge of what He wants from us. How He wants us to react. How He wants us to do. It's all right here. It's all in this book. Our faith should serve as the wire that connects God's power to a circumstance. God's power to the needs of the world. Prayer is the, the cord that connects us. That's what we're saying when we say, may your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. That's what we're saying. We're connecting God's power to a situation. And we want to ground our prayers in Scripture because the most powerful prayers are linked to the promises of God. You want a surefire way to get your prayers answered? Link them to the promises of God. Every time. Because when you're praying that, you can pray with confidence and you know that you will, God's going to hear that because it's His, it's His will anyway. Prayer is supposed to be a two-way street. We talk to God. We forget the part that He talks back to us. He talks to us through the Holy Spirit. A lot of times it's not the audible voice of God that people want. Well, I didn't hear from God that I shouldn't do this, so I did it. I felt, I felt this, this knot in my stomach when I was doing it, but I didn't hear God say anything. Where do you think the knot in your stomach came from? It's the Holy Spirit telling you, don't be stupid. But it's, holy God, I, I don't want to pray to you. I want to pray with you. Move in me while I pray with you. How about this? Give us today the food we need. And most of us never think to pray this. Because we, know, we, have, we don't really worry about where our next meal is coming from. It's probably McDonald's. Most of us don't ever worry about where our next meal comes from. But the point here, this isn't about feeding this. It's about building a dependency on God and a thankfulness for everything. The very essence of sin is the independence from God. There's another aha moment for you. You don't want to put God in the middle of something? It's probably not a place you need to be. This phrase goes in the opposite way. Give us the food that we need for today. For today. It's intentionally short-lived. It means, day by day, we're supposed to be looking to God as the ultimate source of everything that we need. Not just bread, not just food, everything. Everything we need. Nothing is off limits as long as we're praying for the will of God. Philippians 4 and 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. Let your requests with thanksgiving be made known to God. What should we be looking to God for? Everything. Literally. Anything that you're worried about, bring it to God in prayer. Everything. That hits me just as much as it hits anybody else, hopefully. Hopefully. So just for fun, I decided, because this is kind of what I do, just for fun, I decided to flip through Scripture, and I started to look for things that people prayed for. I made myself a little list. And some of these, some of these are very spiritual needs. And some are not. We've got Zacharias and Elizabeth who wanted a family. They couldn't have kids, so they prayed for a son. We all know about Solomon, right? Solomon prayed for wisdom in a new job that God gave him. Samson prayed for water because he was thirsty. But he also prayed for superhuman strength at the end of his life so he could accomplish one more thing for God. 
Joshua, Joshua prayed for the sun to stand still so he could finish fighting with people. Really? Daniel, oh boy, poor Daniel. Daniel had weird dreams, guys. Weird dreams. And he prayed that God would give him the interpretation for those weird dreams. He wanted to know what they meant. How about King David? King David prayed for forgiveness after committing adultery. He asked God to make him whole again. Jesus told us to pray for lost people and for the workers to get the gospel to them. And Jesus' disciples, the apostles, they prayed for Jesus to come back quickly. The bottom line is, is if it matters to you, it matters to God. There's literally not a single assignment that God has given me, not as a father, not as a husband, not as a disciple, not as a friend, not as your pastor. There is not a single thing that God has asked me to do that he has not given me the daily bread I need to do it. Not a single thing. When you trust God, you're never going to get disappointed. Everybody in my life, everybody else in my life has disappointed me at one point or another. The person that's disappointed me the most is me. I have broken more promises to me. I have lied to me more, many, more times than anybody else could ever possibly. I've let me down and broken promises to myself more than anybody else ever could. But learning to trust God gives us rest. Learning to pray doesn't make us less busy, church. Because loving people and being involved in bringing the kingdom of heaven to lost people is going to make you busy. Welcome to church. But learning to pray offers us a less busy heart. And then the work we're doing turns fun. In the middle of everything that's out there, all the noise, all the chaos, all the distractions, prayer will develop this inner quiet. That peace that surpasses all understanding that we always hear about, it gives us this inner quiet because we're spending time with a Father who loves us, who, lives, who listens to us, and we're spending time focusing on what He's doing. Not all the things that we're trying to get done that aren't getting done. We're focusing on what He's doing. We get peace from that. That will bring us calm every time. And forgive us our sins, as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Now, for those of us that hold grudges, we tend to skip this part. This is a part that we'll say, but we don't mean. But that's there for a reason, church. That is up there for a reason. Confessing our sins is an important part of our lives because it helps us clear out sin so it doesn't keep growing and spreading like a virus. That's exactly what it is. I'm going to give you guys another secret today, another aha moment. You guys ready? Write this down. Sin loses its power when it's exposed. So scripture tells us to first confess our sins to God. And then confess it to others. And here's the trick. When we need to. Not everybody knows, needs to know your business. Confess your sins to one another when you need to. If I, if, I do, if I do something that isn't right to Kevin, I need to go confess that sin to Kevin after I talk to God about it. I don't need to tell Amanda that I did something wrong to Kevin and then tell Brad I did something wrong to Kevin before I go to Kevin and tell him about it. It's not how this works. It's not how any of this works. Not everybody needs to know your business. And by doing that, you strip sin of its power. I was thinking to myself the other day, why is it such a big deal? Why is, why is confessing my sins such a big deal? Sometimes if I'm being honest, I can't think of a single thing in the moment that I need to apologize for, that I need forgiveness for. I mean, I can barely remember what I had for breakfast, let alone the sins that I have in my life. 
So I'm going to make a suggestion to you guys. I'm going to, the, the next best thing that you can do is have your wife do it for you. Make, have her make you a list. Don't really do that. Just saying, don't really do that because I don't want to be responsible for the fallout of that little experiment. I'm kidding. But here's what I do. I tend to struggle with three particular areas of sin in my life. What are they, Pastor Chris? I'm not telling you. Because I'm not telling you guys, because I don't want, every time somebody, first of all, I don't want you looking for it. But I don't want every time that somebody sees it, for people to point them out. Jesus points them out to me. I've got people in my life that know about what these are, and they check me almost daily. So don't worry about that. I mean, I don't want to be shopping at the Harley shop and have somebody roll up on me and say, oh, I see your materialism is getting the best of you again, pastor. I don't want that. That takes all the Harley shopping. That makes it no fun. Again, I've got people in my life that check me, that I'm responsible for, and they're responsible to me. The point is, is I go through, as I go through those things, as I start praying for those things in my life, God, I need your help with these things. Again, still. As I start going through those, lo and behold, here comes the Holy Spirit, like the Kool-Aid man, showing me more stuff as he crashes through the wall. He shows me more sins. And it hurts, but it's worth it. It's worth it. I mean, the other thing confession does is it changes our attitude towards other people. The primary thing that, that produces compassion and generosity towards others is remembering how gracious and compassionate God is to you. Whew. Yeah. Take that one. I go, to man, I go to God as a man that's deeply loved because I am a man that's deeply loved. I go to God as a man deeply forgiven because I am a man that's deeply forgiven. And that fosters in me this, it gives me this attitude towards other people, both that need my love and need my forgiveness. We love because Jesus loved us first, guys. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. And I find myself praying this more and more and more lately. I pray it for me. I pray it for all of you. I pray it over my kids. I pray it for people I know. I pray it for people I don't know. Because we live in a very sinful world. And I pray this a lot because I know left to ourselves, myself included, we will go astray every time. Because lurking inside of us are these corruptions that, that want to take us over and destroy us. It's called the sinful human nature. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it before. Scripture tells us that the nature of man doesn't desire the things of God. It doesn't desire faith. It doesn't desire a loving God. It doesn't desire loving purity. It doesn't desire truth. And it doesn't desire righteousness. And if you don't believe me, if you think I'm lying, look at the world out there that doesn't want God and tell me they desire any of those things. Got quiet. Those things aren't natural anymore because we're fallen beings. That means without the grace of God working in us, all of us, me included, we're going to fall away. And this really hit, me, hit home with me recently. I was reading this study, and the question, one of the questions in the study was, I want you to think about pastors of influence that are your age from five years ago. So for me, I would have been 45. Look at people that were 45 years old of pastors of influence of that age five years ago. And where are they now? So I sat back and I looked at the people that affected me five years ago that were my age. And I could think of probably about eight of them. Five out of eight of those men are no longer in ministry. One of them who was a phenomenal pastor, a phenomenal man of God. Every single one of those men were better preachers than me. They preached the word better than me. They were clearly better men than I was. But one of those guys, who was a wonderful pastor that actually got me 
spiritually part of the way through COVID and being locked down, he quit being a minister and became a personal trainer. He didn't see the need for ministry anymore. None of those guys were any different than me. Like I said, most of them were more handsome than I was, but they weren't, they were better preachers, they were better men, but the overwhelming commonality in all of their lives was an absence of real community with God. And it was also not taking seriously the indwelling power of sin. I mean, I need God's grace to overcome the temptations and the weaknesses that I struggle with. And if you guys would pray for me, that would be amazing. My kids need that, and I pray, I pray that over them daily. I mean, you guys all need that, and I pray, when I pray for you guys, each by name, I pray for this. I mean, it's our only hope. But I don't want to end today on a serious and somber note. <laughs> I mean, yes, only God's grace can deliver us from the particular temptations in our heart, especially when we have an enemy who is scheming to attack us with those very temptations that he knows we're our most vulnerable with. And they're all different for every single one of us. But he gets that little fingernail in there and makes you doubt, makes you waver, and next thing you know, you're not doing the will of God anymore. He's already won. But there's a silver lining here. There is a silver lining in all of this. We don't have to be discouraged or scared of the devil. You know why? We can be overcomers. We can be more than conquerors through the promises of Jesus. God said he'd give us a way out. All we have to do is ask for it. So I want to end this message today by giving you guys a few practical suggestions in light of, I don't know how to pray. So the first thing, you got to start, guys. <laughs> you got to start praying. I don't, I don't see that as a big issue here at our church, but if you're not talking to God on the regular, you got to start. But here's a trick, and it's going to seem really weird. Get alone with God. It says lock yourself away, right? Get alone with God. No devices. Put your, leave your phone out there. No computer. Take your smartwatch off. It, it won't track your steps as you pace around your pantry. Get rid of all of your stuff. Lock yourself away from God, and here's the trick. Pray out loud. And yes, it's going to be weird. And yes, it's going to feel uncomfortable. Because hearing it come out of your mouth is different than when you hear it in your head. Get alone with God and pray out loud. It's going to be weird at first, but trust me, it's absolutely worth it. Because it hits different. Here's another one. Pray in the moment with people. You come across somebody or you see somebody that's in need of prayer or you hear somebody on Facebook or social media, pray with, this made all the difference in my life. Pray with them in the moment. Don't just say, Jen, I'm going to be praying for you because guess what? 50% of the time we forget. Pray in the moment. Give them the strength that God has already put in you to do that. Because that's what they need. Don't just tell them, I'll pray for you when I have my prayer time tonight or my favorite, send them a little prayer emoji. Don't do that. Pray for them now. Right then and there. Here's another one that might seem a little weird to you guys. I've done this and it's kind of cool. Prayer walk your neighborhood. Get out, get a little bit of exercise, put the smartwatch back on and track your steps for this one. But get out, prayer walk your neighborhood, but don't be weird about it. Prayer dancing, bad. Okay? Sorry, you guys had to witness that. Prayer dancing is bad. Don't be weird about it. Don't be sneaky. Don't be running up to people's doorknobs, anointing their doorknob with oil because they're going to slip and break a finger. Don't do that. But walk around your neighborhood and pray for the people that live with you. 
They're the people that are closest to you physically. Ask God to open up doors in their lives. For those of us that are parents, pray regularly with your kids. Pray for them, pray with them, have them pray with you, but let them hear you pray. Oh my goodness. Let your kids hear you pray. Be thankful for things. Be apologetic for the things that we screw up in. Ask God for help for you. Ask God for help for other people. You want to teach your kids generosity? Pray with them. Let them hear you pray. But church, the trick is you got to start. You got to start somewhere. And you don't have to be eloquent and you don't have to be long-winded like me. You don't have to make it fancy and you don't have to use the right words. It's not what he's asking for. He's asking for the, he wants to know your heart. And he's asking for that to come out. Because let's face it, prayer's like a muscle. The more you use it, the more it grows. You want to get a strong prayer life, the more you do it, the more it's going to grow. And the more you do pray, the more you want to know how to do it better, so the more conversations you have with God about it, and then the more you want to do it, because the more you're communing with God, all of a sudden you feel this tremendous power in your life all the time. And you can't not have that now. But you got to start. One more song for you guys. All right, church. Well, thank you all for being here with us today. Thank you for your prayers. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for your word and your message today. Thank you for, for showing us how you want us to come to you and the reasons behind it. Lord, I ask that you if there are walls that are holding people in places that, that are, it's hindering them from coming to you with all of this, with all of them, Lord, I ask that you break down those walls. Lord, I ask that you bless the people of this church, bless the people that watch online. Lord, I ask that you, you open up the windows of heaven and, and shower down upon them all of your grace and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We got snacks. Anybody that wants snacks? We've got Ekmek.